Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Abe Denmark. I direct the Asia program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, today we're joined by Dr. Kenneth Pyle uh, from the uh, Professor of at University of Washington, a, uh, one of the most well-respected scholars of Japan, uh, not only in the United States, but also in Japan itself. Uh, he's written several books on Japan, probably the most famous being Japan Rising, uh, arguing that modern Japanese history can be understood as a pattern of uh, Japanese responses to changes in the international environment. Um, he uh, served for 10 years as director of the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies um, and is uh, received the Order of the Rising Sun from the government of Japan, as well as several, several other honors uh, and, and prizes. And we're very uh, honored to have him uh, with us today uh, to talk about his views on Japan and uh, the legacy of the Pacific War um, uh, reflected in uh, his many writings. Uh, so with that, I'll turn things over to you, Dr. Pyle. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak uh, at this time. It's, this is the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. And I think it's a good time to take stock of the legacy of the war and its impact on US-Japan relations. My own feeling is that we Americans are at a time of great change and challenge in the world and in our own best interests. Uh, we need to have a close cooperative relationship with Japan. And if we're to achieve this kind of relationship, I think we need as Americans to understand the impact that we have had on Japan uh, in the last 75 years. I don't believe in general that Americans are terribly self-aware about this. And so that was uh, my main purpose when I wrote my recent book uh, called Japan and the American Century, uh, was uh, written with a goal to help Americans better understand our relations with Japan. So in my remarks today, I want to focus particularly on uh, the American wartime goal of unconditional surrender and the vision that lay behind that policy of a new American-led international order. These uh, two uh, main themes, I think, had a huge long-term influence on Japan right down to today. So, a fundamental understanding of the legacy of the Asia-Pacific War uh, and its influence on our relations, uh, I think, begins, must begin with the unconditional surrender policy of the United States. Franklin Roosevelt announced this policy on January 25th, January 24th, 1943, at his Casablanca conference with Winston Churchill. The interesting thing is World War II was the only foreign war in American history waged to unconditional surrender. It was a war goal wholly without precedent. All other foreign wars in our history, we've had a lot, before and since have ended with an armistice and a negotiated peace. FDR decided that this war would be different. American diplomats were instructed not to discuss conditions for ending the conflict. Compromise and diplomacy were ruled out. This was Roosevelt's unique policy. His Secretary of State, his Secretary of War, his admirals and his generals uh, uh, did not agree with this policy fundamentally. His allies, Churchill and Stalin, had great reservations about it. <clears throat> so this unprecedented goal, which was not carefully deliberated beforehand, was announced primarily with Germany in mind, but it would turn out to have long range consequences for Japan. Why did Roosevelt stubbornly insist on this policy? He had his reasons, four reasons. The first reason was he wanted to mobilize public support. 
fire the resolve of the American people, who after all had been wedded to isolationism and, and neutrality uh, in, the, in the years leading up to uh, Pearl Harbor. Secondly, he wanted to avoid the political weakness that uh, Woodrow Wilson had suffered in the First World War when uh, he, Wilson, had been excoriated by his opponents for being soft on Germany. Third reason he wanted, uh, uh, he wanted to hold the alliance with Stalin together by deferring discussion of specific war goals until later. But the fourth and by far the most important reason was FDR wanted to achieve a free hand uh, to shape an American-led international order. So nothing less than total victory would satisfy his goal of achieving a new liberal world order. And this meant the elimination of all vestiges of fascism and militarism and the democratization of the enemy states. Roosevelt was heir to the liberal uh, belief that wars uh, were generally caused by internal, uh, uh, the internal structure of states, and that if states were democratized, uh, democracies would not fight with each other. And so that is what lay behind uh, his uh, uh, insistence on uh, remaking uh, the uh, fascist states. So what were the consequences of this policy? First, let's look at the immediate consequences. Uh, the unconditional surrender policy uh, had profound implications for the Asia Pacific War, how it would be fought. Uh, because it foreclosed the possibility of dip diplomatic negotiations, it gave priority, total priority really, to military strategy. On the Japan side, uh, unconditional surrender policy led to Japan's unconditional resistance. Uh, and uh, the uh, Japanese leaders were taken aback by Roosevelt's vague and sweeping goals. Uh, which were just generally announced, and these uh, were announced in Roosevelt's speeches. Uh, he said he wanted to first occupy the, uh, the enemy countries, secondly, permanently disarm uh, uh, Japan in this case, conduct war trials. Fourth, he wanted to reform the entire political economic structure as well as Japanese society. And fifth, he wanted to uh, re-educate the Japanese people. So you can see those were sweeping goals. And the uh, Japanese leaders' uh, early hopes for a negotiated peace uh, gave way to unconditional uh, resistance. On the United States side, unconditional surrender meant that the American military must plan for the likelihood of an invasion of Japan to gain complete control of the Japanese homeland. Uh, and also uh, the prospect of invading Japan meant that there was an urgent need for Soviet uh, assistance, uh, which Stalin agreed to uh, uh, promise to uh, provide three months after the end of war in Europe. In return, uh, importantly, in return for major territorial concessions in Northeast Asia. So on the American side, unconditional surrender meant maximum military pressure with maximum speed. All, the, all branches uh, of the military were given uh, incentive to uh, maximize pressure. The Navy would co conduct a strangling naval blockade. Uh, and the Air Force would undertake carpet bombing of, of cities uh, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, break civilian morale. All of this put the Asia-Pacific War on a path to its catastrophic ending with the horrific battle of, of Okinawa 
the fire bombing and devastation of over 60 Japanese cities, and finally, the use of the atomic bomb. In the last year of the war, well more than half a million Japanese civilians perished. The decision to use the atomic bomb was inextricably tied to the unconditional surrender. How was that? Well, in the summer of 1945, American intelligence uh, was telling of a massive, much bigger than expected, a massive Japanese buildup in Kyushu in preparation for the U.S. invasion. And this, this gave the Americans the prospect of unimaginable casualties. And so the unconditional surrender policy created a terrible dilemma for a new and inexperienced president, Harry Truman, and his military advisors. Could the U.S. even undertake an invasion with such prospect of casualties of, 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 of that sort? Uh, the atomic bomb, when it became available, became the panacea for resolving uh, the dilemma. With this weapon, invasion was no longer necessary, uh, and also the Soviet uh, entry into the war and uh, participating in its spoils was no longer necessary. Now, con historical con controversy over the use of the bomb has always swirled among historians, has always swirled around the last few months of the war and President Truman's so-called decision. Uh, I think this is a great mistake. I think uh, it places the issue in too limited a time frame. It was really the momentum created by Roosevelt's unconditional surrender policy uh, that swept the new and inexperienced president forward. By the summer of 45, American uh, public opinion by nine to one in a Gallup poll favored unconditional surrender, even if we had to invade Japan. So Truman, uh, Truman's so-called decision was really one of non-interference, uh, uh, not to upset uh, the Roosevelt legacy and the existing plans. Well, let's pause for just a minute and ask whether unconditional surrender policy was really wise and necessary. Uh, wouldn't a uh, negotiated peace that left a defeated Japan with a measure of independence uh, and provided for a basis for a balance of power in the region, wouldn't that have been uh, pre preferable? Uh, it's hard to answer those questions. They're counterfeit, counterfactual questions. Uh, but um, after all, all other wars have ended with a negotiated peace. And um, we do know that um, by the beginning of 1945, a large number of conservatives in Japan uh, were willing to uh, negotiate a peace so long as the emperor, uh, uh, the imperial system uh, would be uh, maintained. Uh, so we could have perhaps uh, negotiated a peace, uh, uh, pushed Japan back to its own borders and then had sanctions on a defeated but still uh, un independent uh, Japan, uh, sanctions that would have uh, demanded uh, uh, Japanese reforms in return for badly needed aid, uh, uh, technology, trade, investment, and so on. Let's emphasize one other point in this connection. Hitler and Nazism defied compromise. Hitler defied compromise. With Japan, however, compromises were possible. We know that because almost at once when the occupation began, General MacArthur made critical concessions that we had refused to make before surrender. We decided to keep the emperor retain the conservative bureaucratic establishment and keep in place the large conglomerate concentrations of capital, the so-called Zaibatsu, uh, 
all of which were pillars of the old regime. And then most uh, ironic of all, a few years later, uh, we regretted Article 9 of the Constitution uh, and began prodding Japan to rearm as our, as our ally in the Cold War. So considering our post-war retreat uh, from unconditional surrender policy, perhaps it would have been better to have had a less absolute set of goals, uh, quite possibly averting the catastrophic end of the Pacific War. So that's worth uh, thinking about. But my main point here is not this counterfactual question, but rather my main point is to show that unconditional surrender and Japan's subordination in the American world order uh, had a huge con uh, had huge consequences, long-term consequences for, uh, for Japan. Uh, one final point. Uh, with regard to uh, the question of, of a negotiated peace uh, was that if it, if it had been reached before Russia was ready to come into the war, uh, it would have prevented Stalin from gaining the major territorial concessions that uh, he ultimately uh, took uh, from uh, the islands north of Japan and most consequentially, it would have prevented the uh, division of the Korean Peninsula, uh, how, how different things would have been. But again, that's counterfactual. Well, so much for the immediate consequences of the policy. <clears throat> Let's turn now to the long range influence of unconditional surrender policy. First, uh, the un unprecedented unconditional surrender policy permitted the U.S. to take what became the most intrusive international reconstruction of another nation in modern history. We brushed aside international law, which pro prohibited such total reconstruction of a defeated nation. And so Japan's ancient and complex civilization was to be remade according to American values and institutions, which we confidently preserve, presumed were of universal applicability. So we basically had uh, or chose uh, to overlook the importance of a people's culture, history, traditions, and so on, and proceeded uh, to, uh, uh, to into a wholesale uh, reform of Japanese institutions uh, and values, beginning with a hastily written constitution, written by Americans uh, in, believe it or not, about six days. Uh, it, it was, MacArthur called it the most liberal constitution in history, and it probably was. It included every uh, human right that we could think of, uh, many of which are not in the American Constitution, including uh, equal rights for women, still not in the American Constitution. Uh, but we went on to re-engineer uh, the entire uh, society and re-educate the people. In our enthusiasm, there was hardly a detail that we didn't overlook. Uh, the economic order, education, religion, the written language, even the most intimate aspects of Japanese society, such as the family, uh, parental authority, male-female relations, love and marriage. No detail was too small. There was even a postage stamp directive uh, which, which uh, indicated uh, or regulated the pictures and designs that could be shown on the face of stamps. So the unfortunate truth in a way is that this was an American revolution in Japan. It was not a Japanese revolution. So imposing democracy from the outside uh, was really no substitute for a genuine democratic revolution. Um, uh, to uh, simply uh, require that the Japanese become democratic uh, was to ignore the fact that uh, Democracy, if it's to work, uh, 
must be owned by the people. It must be achieved. It must be to be lasting. It must be in the lifeblood and experience and the history of a people. Um, and uh, historians now more and more are uncovering great evidence uh, in the early post-war period that Japan, the Japanese people were really ready for a democratic revolution. Uh, the military was discredited by the most disastrous defeat in Japanese history. Uh, and public opinion polls uh, showed that over 50% of Japanese favored electing a special committee or convention to revise the constitution. Um, and then to make matters worse, when the Cold War began two, two years later, uh, we backtracked on our democratization goals and began working closely with and helping to restore the conservative, undemocratic Japanese elite. So in a way, the Japanese were doubly uh, handicapped. Uh, democracy was imposed, and then it was turned over, uh, uh, democratic institutions were turned over to a non-democratic uh, elite. Turning to a second long range result of unconditional surrender policy was Japan's long term subordination in the American world order. So when the Cold War began in 48 and 49, uh, the Pentagon insisted that the price that Japan would have to pay for ending the occupation was, grow, was agreeing to American bases, uh, maintaining permanent bases in Japan. So when the San Francisco Peace Treaty was signed September 8th, 1951, ending the occupation, Japan's prime minister the same day in a secret uh, uh, meeting uh, agreed to sign a military alliance with the United States which gave us the right to maintain long-term bases in Japan and effectively ensuring control of Japanese foreign policy so that Japan could not choose an independent role in the Cold War. So this highly unequal alliance, a hegemonic alliance, was imposed on Japan while it was still occupied by over 200,000 uh, American troops. A third legacy of the unconditional surrender policy followed from this subordination of Japan and the American, uh, American led world order. The Japanese leaders proved very shrewd in finding a way to successfully adapt to their subordinate status. They formulated a unique strategy, I call it the Yoshida strategy or the Yoshida doctrine after Japan's uh, uh, post war prime minister. Uh, they formulated a unique strategy of pursuing their economic interests while passively deferring to American military and political domination. Because of the Cold War, they knew the U.S. would have no choice but to defend Japan and also that the U.S. would keep its market open to Japanese goods. So it was a grand strategy, grand strategy of the Japanese of choosing full dependence on the U.S. for its uh, for its uh, uh, national security. So um, with the path to political independence foreclosed by the military alliance, Japan chose the one remaining path to autonomy uh, and restoration of Japanese power and standing in the world. The nation acted really like a merchant state. For the entire period of the Cold War, Japan, Japan chose to abstain from any involvement in international political military affairs by adapting a, adopting a series of self-binding policies to avoid active involvement in the Cold War. I call these measures the nine negatives or the nine no's just to quickly enumerate them, and they were all worked out in uh, announced policies uh, uh, by the Japanese themselves. No overseas deployment of the self-defense forces, no participation in collective defense, no power projection 
power projection capability, no, no possession of nuclear arms, no arms exports, no sharing of defense-related technology with another country, no spending of more than 1% of GNP for defense, no military use of space, and no foreign aid for military purposes. So Japan defined itself as a trading state uh, and paid the US uh, billions of dollars to provide its security. So incredibly, the Japanese had no plan of their own, uh, no legislation that would allow the government to deal with national emergencies. Japan, supposedly a so sovereign country, had in effect no plans for ensuring its national security. Dependence had become the nation's foreign policy. However, when the Cold War came to an end, the strategy was no longer viable. America was no longer willing to provide automatic security guarantees, but instead demanded that Japan play an active role in its own defense and in maintaining global order. So Japan was totally unprepared for the post-Cold War era. Exclusive concentration of economic growth left the nation without political strategic institutions, crisis management practice, intelligence gathering, or strategic planning. And it has taken a series of foreign policy crises uh, since the end of the Cold War to gradually step-by-step step, force Japan to develop the needed, the needed infrastructure required uh, uh, by uh, the new uh, uh, world situation. They had to develop, in other words, greater symmetry between the economic and political dimensions of its international role. Well, especially since, and I'm jumping ahead here, especially since 2012 and the prime ministership of Abe Shinzo, Japan has made uh, important strides in this direction by creating a national security council, uh, developing a national security strategy, uh, improving states uh, security, uh, uh, intelligence uh, gathering, uh, and most importantly, uh, reinterpreting the constitution to make collective security uh, constitutional. So as a result, the US-Japan Alliance has now, uh, is now gradually becoming much, much more reciprocal than it ever was in the Cold War. Uh, the changing situation in Japan, the emergence of China, uh, assertive uh, policies, on, particularly under Xi Jinping, and the North Korean nuclear uh, juggernaut, these uh, have uh, worked to produce much greater integration, interoperability, coordination, and scope of cooperation between Japan and the United States. The self-imposed nine negatives that I referred to before have all but one, and that's the nuclear ban, all but one have been lift, lifted and uh, Abe has adopted a proactive and more independent foreign policy not seen since 1945. Finally, uh, one more uh, point, uh, long range consequence uh, of uh, unconditional surrender policy was having had these alien institutions and values imposed on Japan by the occupation has led to decades of controversy among the Japanese over the fitness and suitability of those values and institutions for Japan, given its own history and culture and uh, traditions. Uh, and we've seen that in particular over the constitution and its utopian preamble and, and its principles and so on. But the same kind of controversy has existed with regard to education, for example, the, uh, the economy uh, and uh, uh, various aspects of, of uh, 
of legal reforms that were introduced by the occupation. So finally, in that regard, how did Japan become a democracy? Because it is a democracy today, albeit a pretty much a one party democracy, but still it is a democracy. It didn't become, in my judgment, a democracy uh, as a result of the so-called MacArthur Constitution. It became a democracy, I think, through a series of uh, popular uh, movements uh, against government policy. First, uh, against the uh, security treaty in the 1950s. In the 1970s, um, uh, popular demonstrations against uh, the uh, pollution and uh, the uh, consequences of rapid economic growth, urban crowding, and so on. Uh, and most recently, uh, uh, popular uh, uh, anger over the uh, uh, nuclear uh, explosion in Fukushima that followed the uh, tsunami and so on, and which revealed uh, corruption and close ties between big business and uh, private enterprise and the bureaucracy. So these uh, several, and I could name more, popular uh, series of demonstrations over decades have gradually forced the, the government to be more accountable uh, to uh, the Japanese people. So important to the development of uh, Japanese democracy. So then to conclude, as we reflect on the course of post-war US-Japan uh, relations, we'll never know how things might have been different or might have led to better outcomes if America had been open to negotiating an end to the war. Uh, but as it did, ha as it actually transpired, the peculiar character of American belligerency led, led to Japan's subordination in the American world order and shaped its politics and social movements for the last uh, 75 years. But the day when this kind of subordination would end was bound to come in one way or another. So early in the 21st century, uh, in my view, the prevailing international order is eroding. In Asia, power is in unprecedented flux. American primacy and the framework of rules and institutions uh, is being challenged by China as outdated and not reflective of the changing distribution of inter international power. A new nationalist orientation of the Trump administration has raised uncertainty over America's continued commitment to the liberal international order. So as the world undergoes fundamental change, the post-war period of extraordinary American domination of Japan uh, is passing. And uh, we're coming into a new era now. And my own uh, strong feeling is that in this new era, uh, our two countries, Japan and the United States, will need to forge a new and more cooperative relationship. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was just fascinating. Um, very, very interesting. Very much appreciated. I'm wondering um, if I could ask a couple questions um, just to dry, dry out a bit more. Yeah. Um, and you left off talking about the fraying order. And I wondered if we could uh, dip into that a bit um, in that you started by talking about how Roosevelt and many of the other Americans approached uh, Japan uh, after the war um, with the belief that the shaping Japan internally as a democracy, as a free market economy, similar to Germany, um, would make them more, uh, more uh, uh, conducive to our interests, not bellicose, um, supporters of our interests, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and more broadly, I think they, um, Americans and others in the West saw democracy as sort of the, uh, 
a natural progression of humanity, including universal human rights, uh, women's rights, individualism. Um, but what we've, on one hand, we found that it, in the cases of Germany and Japan, it worked. Um, in that both Germany and Japan have been prosperous. Um, they haven't started any conflicts. Um, and uh, they are both quite robust democracies um, at this point. Um, yet there's also a sense that uh, faith in democracy, faith in liberalism is fraying, the order is fraying um, in some parts of Asia, um, but not in others. I'm wondering if we could um, explore that a bit. Um, and if, you, if your sense is that um, if the uh, post-war sort of faith in democracy uh, is fraying, or the belief that it's the next obvious natural step of progression of humanity, um, at the same time that the United States, perception of the United States is diminishing, that the US-led liberal order seems to be fraying. Uh, do you see these phenomena as somewhat linked, or do you think they're happening at the same time, but not, not necessarily um, symptoms of the same underlying challenge. The link between the fraying of the international order and and what, right? And a fraying of uh, democracy, a belief in democracy, the spread of democracy in Asia. Yes. Uh, well, I do think there's uh, grounds for for that belief. Of course, uh, what we see in, in China is a kind of digital authoritarianism, which is the absolute antithesis. It's really what George Orwell prophesied in, in uh, his writings. Uh, we're seeing before our very eyes in China today, but China is not Asia. China is a big part of Asia, but as you look around Asia, uh, for example, South Korea, uh, you have uh, a viable uh, uh, democracy. Uh, in the most recent election, the South Korean people came out in the midst of a pandemic uh, and uh, uh, in, in, in record numbers, really, uh, to, to show their support for democracy. You see uh, a viable and uh, vibrant democracy in Taiwan. Uh, you see the uh, in Hong Kong, you see the uh, uh, protests there uh, speaking for democracy. So I don't think that uh, we should be too quick to say that democracy in Asia is, is waning. It certainly is a great, uh, uh, great threat uh, that China represents to us. And uh, my own belief is that, uh, is that uh, to deal with the uh, uh, authoritarian threat that China really poses for us is uh, the really important thing here is, and this was what I was getting at when I talked about a new and more cold close and cooperative relationship with Japan is that I think we need to uh, uh, rehabilitate and, uh, and, uh, and renew our alliances uh, in, in Asia uh, so as to maintain a, uh, a viable balance of power. Um, I guess you could say I'm a realist uh, and going back to my implied criticism of Roosevelt, uh, I join realists like uh, Morgenthau and George Kennan and uh, many others who were, who were uh, quite critical of Roosevelt's belief that uh, a one world uh, working with Stalin was, was possible. But uh, to come down to today, I think, uh, uh, yes, the, uh, American world order, the American century, uh, is, uh, you could say it's in its twilight. The final chapter of my book is entitled that. Uh, but but uh, what that means to me is that we need to create a new kind of order, uh, which, uh, as, as I say, would uh, imply uh, building the kind of alliance uh, structure that uh, 
Interestingly, Abe himself uh, has taken a lead in this uh, by uh, stressing uh, uh, what he calls the, uh, the, the quad, uh, working with closely with India and Australia and so on. I, I completely agree, actually. You clearly, you haven't seen um, my book that's coming out in, in August yet, but it says pretty much exactly what you just said. Um, I even, uh, the title even reflects uh, the title of your old book. Mine is a U.S. strategy for the Asian century. Um, so it's a little homage uh, to you. Hard to read it. <laughs> um, no, I, I completely agree on, on that. Um, I, I just think that the, when people think about the Pacific War, they often think about uh, the battles and the, the politics, uh, the, the, the military aspects of things, but really do they think about uh, the role that values play and how um, the United States uh, sought to, to change uh, Japan. Um, and that um, Japan has played, uh, and to my mind, a very uh, constructive role in Asia since the end of the war. Um, and maybe it's one of the positive pieces that have come out of the tragedy that was the, the Pacific War. It was the tremendously beneficial role that Japan is playing uh, for its own people and for the rest of the region. Um, the, the last question I wanted to, to ask you, um, jumping off of what you said before, um, in terms of um, Japan, so the um, um, Japan's sort of uh, approach to restraint and how the, the shackles have been falling away a bit um, in, in, in uh, how their approach to security and to military issues. Um, as assuming China continues to rise, assuming um, that they continue to act with a tremendous amount of assertiveness and aggression, especially in the East China Sea when it comes to issues of, of Japan, um, do you see that uh, Japan will conti likely continue down this line um, of being more active and being more um, um, acting more like a normal country um, in terms of asserting security interests? Or do you ex expect to continue to uh, disp display some unique features of being rather uh, restrained according to uh, Article 9? Japan has always been uh, very good in um, responding and reacting to changes in the international system. And uh, the Japanese uh, are, are highly sensitive to changes in the international system. And so they are watching very closely right now what is happening in America. Uh, what is the future of the American role in, in Asia? Uh, <clears throat> are we, uh, you know, the Trump administration has talked about about uh, has questioned the value of the alliance uh, alliances and uh, also uh, host nation support, which they uh, which has been said to be uh, uh, is going to be uh, renegotiated and so on. So the Japanese are are very closely looking at the uh, at the changes in the international uh, system, particularly in East Asia. And uh, my own feeling is that uh, much of the future of the Japanese security uh, consciousness is going to be shaped by us, by our reaction, not, not totally by any means. Uh, in fact, there's, a, there's right now a very interesting controversy brewing just below the radar in Japan which uh, it's being proposed uh, over the last two or three years that Japan take on the ability to have missiles to uh, strike enemy uh, enemy uh, targets where uh, on the, uh, where uh, it's expected that missiles might be shot, say from North Korea. So Japan is uh, seriously considering, and I would not be surprised to see this come through in the next year or so, to uh, take on the uh, right to, uh, to uh, have the ability to shoot down enemy missiles. Uh, uh, it would be opposed by a lot of the uh, population, 
but the interesting thing in Japan is that uh, Abe uh, has been able to make changes, for example, collective security. He was able to make that in spite of overwhelming popular uh, opposition. He simply reinterpreted the constitution. And uh, he, he has been able to, uh, and the, the conservatives have been able to uh, reinterpret the constitution uh, for decades, largely because the Supreme Court in Japan has said this is a political issue, Article 9 is a political issue, and we, uh, the Supreme Court, will not rule on that. So that leaves it to the politicians, and, uh, and with the strength of the Liberal Democratic Party, the conservatives, uh, have the power to simply reinterpret the Constitution. So uh, my own feeling is Japan is, uh, is probably uh, on, the, on the brink of, a, uh, uh, of major changes in its security policy. I know, I know uh, many of my colleagues don't agree with that, but my own feeling is that Japan is going to uh, uh, the changes that are going on, uh, particularly with regard to China, but also North Korea, mainly w with regard to China and the, and the South China Sea and the East China Sea uh, uh, controversies, I think you're going to see Japan become uh, uh, much more proactive if, if much will depend on the American role. And if we pull back from, from Asia, uh, in various uh, ways and policies, uh, you can look to Japan to, Sam Huntington said this many years ago, somebody asked Sam Huntington, uh, what would you do if the United States pulled back from Asia? And he said, well, if the US pulls back and I were Japanese, I would cut a deal with China. Uh, so uh, if we pull back from Asia, there is the danger that Japan would strike a, a, a deal with, with China and probably go nuclear uh, to uh, maintain its, its, uh, its independence. And right now, uh, in, the, in the last couple of years, you've seen Abe try to kind of thread the needle and have uh, somewhat closer relations with Xi Jinping. He was even going to come to Japan uh, recently, but that had to be canceled because of the virus. Yeah. Um, to not end on a, a downer, um, if, if this happens, if the United States, if um, the opposite of what you expect happens, if the United States is actually able to come back um, and turn things around in terms of perceptions of American power from where it is now, um, post coronavirus, uh, et cetera. Would you, would you expect Japan to sort of retreat back into a more restrained approach, or do you think it would still be active uh, and more uh, uh, as it has been over the past few years? I think Japan will continue to be active, partly because we will expect them to be, uh, but also because uh, the leaders in the Liberal Democratic Party. Uh, want to see Japan uh, have uh, the uh, ability, the autonomy uh, to uh, make its own policy in close cooperation with the Americans. So if the Americans come back, uh, as you put it, uh, I would expect that it would slow down a bit the, the uh, change in Japanese security policy but nonetheless, uh, if you look at the uh, alternatives to Abe as he comes to the end of his term, unless, unless he's given an, a, a, a new term, which is up in the air right now, uh, the alternatives to Abe's uh, policies are, are uh, uh, the leading alternatives uh, are, uh, are guys, men who would uh, go along with his more proactive policies. So I, I, I think the tempo would change with an American uh, comeback, but, uh, but not the basic direction. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Pyle, University of Washington. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Doitashimashite. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.